I'm very excited to, to introduce Laura Newberg, uh, who's going to be giving a colloquium today this evening. So, so Laura is an experimental cosmologist, uh, which we don't have often, so it's very excited to have her here. Um, she actually went to undergraduate, uh, her undergraduate, got her undergraduate degree at Bernard College, um, right here in town in, in New York City, uh, after which she got a PhD at Columbia University, where her advisor was Amber Miller, um, who's now a dean at USC. Uh, after that, she did two postdocs, one in Princeton, uh, uh, working with Suzanne Staggs, after which um, she spent some time at the Dunlap Institute at the University of Toronto, working with Keith Vanderland. And so she's been very involved in uh, 21 centimeter intensity mapping, uh, specifically working with the, working on the chime, chime survey in order to uh, specifically look, map the, the beam effect for the maps, which is very, which is very, for the instrument, which is very important if you want to be able to make good maps. And so she's been very instrumental in, in doing exciting work with that. In addition, she's also been working with the Harris experiments, also a 21 centimeter experiment. Um, at, in addition, um, she's also been involved with several CMB surveys um, doing instrumentation. First, with uh, once with ACT with the, with the ACT experiment and ACT poll, uh, which maps the CMB over over um, a very high resolution over small areas in order to um, probe uh, cosmology, including um, clusters from the SE effect. Uh, in addition, she uh, and she's also been able to use that work and transfer it to to the new uh, to um, the newly being built um, Simons Observatory, in addition, where she's now working um, full time, um, helping helping with uh, well leading the effort for um, moving ancillary data, um, which is which is very important if you want to actually again make good maps. So um, we're very excited to have her here, and today she's going to be talking about her work with 21 centimeters, specifically with China. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, for having me. It's uh, great to be back in New York. Uh, so I'll be uh, talking about maps of large-scale structure with two different probes of cosmology. One is 21 centimeter intensity mapping, and then also briefly uh, cosmic microwave background measurements. Um, so Brian Green said it nicely, if slightly dramatically, that we as humans are storytellers, and what could possibly be more grand than the story of creation? So you can take it up with him if you disagree uh, with what could be more grand than the history of creation. Um, but certainly cosmologists have a really interesting story to tell. So uh, we know the universe started off in a big bang about 14 billion years ago. We believe it proceeded through a period of rapid expansion, a period we call inflation, expanding over 25 orders of magnitude in the space of less than a second. From there, the universe went on uh, uh, through a period of more lackadaisical expansion, uh, eventually recombining to form neutral hydrogen um, and creating the cosmic microwave background, which we measure today in millimeter bands. The universe continued to expand over time as galaxies and stars and clusters of galaxies formed. And that expansion rate picked up. Sorry. You should stand closer to my computer. That expansion rate picked up about 4 billion years ago as it began to accelerate, something we attribute to dark energy. So this is a pretty beautiful picture of the entire history of the universe. Uh, clearly, we know everything we possibly could about the universe at this point. But if you take a cosmologist out and uh, give them a few beers and ask them more specifics about this picture, we might be a little bit more honest. So we will tell you that this period of rapid expansion, when the universe was very young, we have no uh, unique evidence indicating that it definitely had to have happened. So we have no proof that this period of rapid expansion uh, was necessarily the thing governing the way the universe looks today. Um, this period of time when the universe was largely neutral before structures formed, uh, we know very little about that as well. There are basically no measurements from that time. The way that the first stars turned on and ionized the universe, we know very little about that as well. There are very few measurements from that period of time. And this uh, dark energy causing the accelerated expansion of the universe, we also uh, find that to be a large mystery. We just have no idea what's going on there either. So there are a lot of uh, questions left in cosmology to answer. 
I'm going to be focusing on uh, this last question of what is dark energy and what is causing the accelerated expansion of the universe. And because I am an experimentalist, I'm specifically going to be focusing on ways that we might constrain this with data. So um, I sort of uh, go by the motto, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. So I'll be talking about two types of measurements we hope to make to understand dark energy better. One is measurements of large scale structure with Chime and Hyrax. And then uh, the other are uh, measurements of the cosmic microwave background with both ACT and the Simons Observatory. Okay, so um, when you go and make measurements of both large scale structure and the CMB, I made those sound very separate. The CMB happened when the universe was about 400,000 years old. Um, structure today, uh, you know, are the locations of galaxies uh, in the universe today. Those two things sound very, very separate. However, they are linked by a fundamental scale. So if you measure the cosmic microwave background um, and stack on all of little hot spots, you'll find a ring in, that, in those measurements. If you do the same thing with uh, galaxy surveys, you will also find a ring, and this is an artist depiction, not a real measurement, but you will find the same fundamental scale shows up both in the cosmic microwave background and also again in the distribution of large scale structure of the universe in the universe much, much later. So if you're a cosmologist, you might know why. If you're not, this might sound very confusing. Why would some scale that um, happened when the universe was very young show up again much, much later in the distribution of galaxies? Um, I don't understand that picture. Uh, these are measurements of the cosmic microwave backgrounds. If you took a map of the sky at millimeter wavelengths, found all of the hot spots in them, and stacked those hot spots on top of each other, you would find um, a map that looks like this. So it's a hot spot in the center and then some rings around it. Um, sorry, maybe I'll stand closer to my computer. Um, okay, so uh, these two scales are fundamentally linked. Um, the reason is actually fairly straightforward, but we have to cast our minds all the way back to the um, early universe to figure out why. So um, we're going to watch um, a, uh, a pressure wave propagate outwards from an overdense region. So when the universe was young, um, it was a plasma filled with photons and baryons. Um, those, uh, that plasma had overdense regions, and those overdense regions seeded pressure waves that propagated outwards from that overdense region. So we're going to watch one of these waves um, as it uh, propagates through the universe. At, uh, specifically when the universe was young, so when this photon baryon fluid is coupled together. So we're going to watch this pressure wave in the baryon density, in the photon density, and then if you want to, in the radial profile. So this is just, uh, if you take a point, sort of average around it, um, average in a ring around it, how many photons and baryons do you count? So that's the radial profile, so a 1D version of this picture. Okay, so we start out with a pressure wave. Uh, it begins at uh, T less than 380,000 years after the Big Bang. Um, after a little time later, that pressure wave has propagated outwards from this central region. So we have a ring propagating outwards. Um, at time still less than 380,000 years after the Big Bang, um, this photon baryon fluid is still coupled. So it turns out that the baryons and the photons are just moving with each other through this fluid. So What's we outside the circle? Uh, uh, the average density of the of this fluid, yeah. Um, so uh, so we see that the baryons and the photons are tracking each other because this fluid is coupled together, and you can see that even more clearly in this radial profile where the photons in red and the baryons in blue are right on top of each other. Something curious happens when the universe is about 400,000 years old. At this point, neutral hydrogen, the universe has expanded enough that neutral hydrogen can form. The fluid starts to decouple, so you no longer have uh, coupled photons and baryons, and the photons begin to free stream away from this ring. So the ring in baryons has continued to sort of uh, propagate outwards from the central region, and the, bar and the photons are starting to sort of diffuse away. Um, and you can see that again more clearly in the radial profile, where the baryons still look fairly peaked, and the photons are starting to move away, and that peak is starting to decrease. If we look even further uh, in time afterwards, the baryons have continued to move. This pressure wave is still moving through the baryons, and the photons have started to diffuse away even further. And if we go a little while uh, afterwards, 
the um, photons have almost completely diffused away. So in red, they're just sort of some average low level. Um, but the baryons have started to move back towards the center of this overdense region. So there's still this central overdense region in the middle. The baryons begin to move backwards down. So you can see that in the radial profile. You still have this ring-like feature uh, from the initial uh, pressure wave propagating up from the center, but the baryons are beginning to get pulled back by a center dark matter core. And then finally, all the way to today, the photons have now streamed uh, away from this overdense region entirely. You see them now as the cosmic microwave background. The baryons have now, uh, um, many of them have fallen back towards the center overdense potential where all the dark matter has lived, but we still get this remnant ring from this pressure wave. Is this consistent with the universe being homogeneous? Yes, on average, yeah. Um, so this is, um, this is a statistical measurement um, across the entire sky. So this, I mean, this is just a simulate, uh, this is just a cartoon picture of one pressure wave. Um, so, right, so I'm getting there. So you don't have to believe me that this happens. It's actually been measured. So, sorry, let me go back. Um, because we have more baryons here in this ring and also here in the center where the dark matter lives, preferentially we will form galaxies and clusters of galaxies in these overdense spots. So we will preferentially form galaxies here in the middle of this well and also here in this ring feature um, around the, the well. You don't have to believe me. Um, we have made measurements with galaxy surveys. So this is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. They went out and measured over 300,000 galaxies. Um, uh, if you take every single galaxy um, and uh, uh, ask how many galaxies are around it, you will pull out this, uh, this uh, ring-like feature. So what this is saying is we have detected statistically evidence from this ring, these rings that um, began when the universe was 400,000 years old. They are present now in the distribution of large-scale structure, and we can see them when we look in galaxies, statistically when we look in galaxy surveys for this feature. Um, right. Uh, and uh, just to pull this back again, this is all fundamentally linked back to measurements of the cosmic microwave background where we also have these ring-like features in the photon distribution. So we can see it in galaxies. We can also see it in, uh, in the cosmic microwave background. Um, this is an extremely important thing to have established because it means that we can use it to understand the expansion rate of the universe. So we have a fundamental scale that was set when the universe formed the cosmic microwave background. We see it today in the distribution of galaxies. And uh, that scale, because it expanded as the universe expanded, can be used to link measurements that we make in the cosmic microwave background with measurements that we make in the distribution of galaxies. Um, we can use that to infer the expansion rate of the universe over time as we compare sort of slices of the universe, um, uh, rings and slices of the universe through large scale structure measurements and galaxy surveys. Okay, so that means that we can, um, we can form a sensitive probe of dark energy uh, through measurements of galaxy surveys because uh, these rings are a these rings that we measure statistically are a sensitive probe of the expansion rate of the universe because dark energy is fundamentally impacting the expansion rate of the universe. We can now try to understand stuff about dark energy through making measurements of, of the distribution of galaxies to pull out these ring-like features. So I should give these ring-like features a name. They are called baryon acoustic oscillations. Um, and uh, this, I should just note, is a really nice seven sigma result from, uh, from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey measurement, um, just to put a number on that. Okay, so what do we actually measure when we measure dark energy? Um, well, we usually measure the equation of state. So the equation of state links the pressure of a given component with its density. Uh, if we plug that into our uh, GR and uh, our, our favorite cosmology metric ever, you can write down how the um, density of a given component expands as the universe expands. Um, so uh, we parameterize that with a scale factor that just tells us how big the universe is relative to today. Um, so it was uh, smaller in the past, bigger now, or one now. Um, we can... Uh, 
get a handle on what this uh, equation of state parameter W actually means uh, for you know, different things that we're kind of familiar with. So uh, for example, matter has, an, has a W equal to one. So I can do this math. If I put W into this equation, I find that the density of matter goes down as the uh, scale factor to the minus three. So it goes down like volume. That's exactly how you'd expect matter to go down as the universe expands, it goes down like volume. Um, uh, we, uh, something kind of special happens um, uh, when, uh, when I put in a W equals minus one. So again, I can do that math. If I put minus one in, I find that uh, the density of that given component um, is just a constant. So this just becomes a number. Um, something that behaved that way would eventually begin to overcome the uh, other components in the universe because it's constant while everything else we know about, things like matter and radiation, go down. Um, as far as we can tell, that's actually exactly the uh, picture of dark energy that we, uh, that, the, that is what the measurements tell us dark energy acts like today. Um, so this stuff is kind of weird. Uh, a constant equation of state means something like you have a particle, you put it in a box. Um, as you expand the box and say double its volume, you end up with two particles instead of one. So it's a weird kind of, kind of stuff. It's not really like anything we expect. So dark energy is very strange, and uh, as far as we can tell, it's obeying this W equals minus one um, constraint, which means that it, is, uh, it has actually, at this point, begun to dominate the uh, energy content of the universe. So as the universe has expanded, the um, density of matter and radiation has gone down, and it seems like today we are dominated by this, this dark energy stuff. So today, it makes up about 72% of the total energy content of the universe. Almost the rest, the, uh, rest of it is made up by uh, dark matter, and then a little tiny bit of it is made up by the stuff we're used to today. OK, so this stuff is weird. Uh, dark energy doesn't act like normal matter. Uh, we make more of it as the universe expands, which seems kind of strange. It dominates the total energy content of the universe, so it's clearly fairly important that we understand it. Um, but we don't have a lot of amazing models for understanding uh, what it actually is. Um, so how do we probe this? How do we understand this better? Uh, so again, I'm an experimentalist, so if I, can't, uh, if I can't measure it, I can't improve it. So what measurement can we make to try to make better statements about what dark energy is? So we can note that even though our best constraint on dark energy makes it look sort of like a constant, um, there, are, there is an error bar associated with that number. So it is possible to have deviations from minus one, um, uh, which would uh, inject perhaps a time dependence on the uh, equation of state of dark energy. Many theorists would possibly be interested in such, such a model. Um, and so one possibility is that we just measure the time dependence of dark energy. So we go back further in time, instead of making measurements today, which is where we've constrained it with the current galaxy surveys, we march back in this line and go back in time and try to understand if it's deviating from a constant or if it's in fact consistent with a constant uh, even at uh, uh, further back in time. So that means that the best measurement we can hope to, uh, best constraint we can hope to put on dark energy will come from making measurements further back in time so that we can understand this time dependence and check whether or not it's truly constant or not. Um, so this is not an original thought. Um, uh, these galaxy surveys, the ones that made the nice seven sigma results, the, um, uh, they went out to measure BAO, these baryon acoustic oscillations, specifically to try to measure dark energy better. So how well have we done? So a variety of different galaxy surveys have results. So you can see some of them are down here at redshifts between uh, zero and one, so sort of now back a few giga years. Um, but they miss uh, a whole portion of the history of the universe when dark energy could p potentially be dynamically important if it turns out there's a, there's a time dependence to it. I am missing one measurement at one and a half. Um, it's, it's not entirely out of laziness. It turns out that we don't, have, we don't make these plots in time very frequently. So there is a point at one and a half that uh, has uh, uh, error bars that are a, a little bit larger than that one. Um, so, uh, so we have these, uh, oh, and by the way, the seven sigma result is that one right there. Um, so the, the nice pretty little error bars. 
Uh, so we have measurements at low redshift, but you can see they're not necessarily terribly constraining. So we've divided out a, a, our usual cosmological constant model. So uh, this straight line would just be a constant equation of state, so no time dependence at all. So you can see that um, we uh, you know, have some constraining power for sure, but it's not, uh, you know, it's not terribly well constrained. I mean, these are small numbers. It's 5%, right? So it's, it's a good measurement, but, uh, but um, you know, we, we, we could imagine doing better. And then there's this one measurement out here and also a missing one in the middle at 1.5. Okay, so it would be nice to uh, measure redshift ranges uh, at, in these intermediate redshift ranges between one and two to um, start uh, really picking apart this question of whether or not there's a time dependence. And while we're at it, it would also be nice if we had error bars that looked more like this uh, over that whole redshift range. Um, so what do we do? One option is we uh, make a, an even bigger galaxy survey. So make a much better optical telescope which, with way better detectors that can measure galaxies at very high redshift. Uh, that is an ongoing effort. But we can also note something fairly important, which is um, the scale of the, this, this interesting BAO feature is very large relative to a galaxy. So on this plot, this is again that Sloan Digital Sky Survey of 300,000 galaxies. Our scale of interest is about the size of that red uh, circle. So much larger than any individual galaxy. So we can imagine sort of blurring this whole thing out and we could still pick out this feature that we care about that's gonna constrain dark energy, but uh, we don't necessarily have to measure individual galaxies to get that, that, uh, that uh, constraint on this, on this um, this baryon acoustic oscillation scale. So we don't need galaxies necessarily, but we do need something that traces the matter distribution the same way that galaxies do. And we also need something that has redshift information so that we can make markers as a function of time and pick out the time dependence. Um, so uh, what are our options for this? Well, it turns out nature has actually given us a way to do exactly that sort of survey. So uh, neutral hydrogen emits at 21 centimeters when uh, the electron goes from aligned with the proton to anti-aligned, it emits a little 21 centimeter photon. Um, 20, uh, neutral hydrogen is uh, very abundant in the universe. This is a picture of a galaxy in the optical wavelengths, and this is a 21 centimeter measurement um, of the same galaxy. So there's a lot of neutral hydrogen living in galaxies. Um, so this uh, gives us a couple of the things that we wanted. One, if we make measurements with 21 centimeter uh, surveys, we can measure uh, the distribution of galaxies because neutral hydrogen lives in galaxies. And we have a natural redshift marker via the 21 centimeter emission line that neutral hydrogen emits in. So if we wanted to make a survey that filled in that redshift range, say 0.8 to 2.5, and made the measurement with a 21 centimeter telescope, what wavelengths would we be talking about? So a redshift of 2.5, uh, if you are a neutral hydrogen atom and you emit 21 centimeter radiation at a redshift of 2.5, that gets redshifted all the way to us today such that you're a 75 centimeter photon, so that's a 400 megahertz uh, wave. Um, at a redshift of 0.8, a 21 centimeter photon is now redshifted down to uh, a 38 centimeter photon or about 800 megahertz. So you are safely in a radio astronomy regime by making measurements of uh, redshifted 21 centimeter. You could have known that anyway from the fact that it's a 21 centimeter measurement, but uh, there you go. So if you wanted to make measurements of 21 centimeter uh, at redshifts between 0.8 and 2.5, you'd build an instrument that works between 400 and 800 megahertz. So we've built it. This is CHIME, the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiments. It consists of four cylinders, which are each 20 meters by 100 meters long. So we go one, two, three, and four. So they're 20 meters wide in this direction, and then 20 meters long into the plane of the board. We've instrumented them with over 1,000 dual polarization feeds, so that's 2,000 channels that are uh, being measured by our, uh, by our detectors. Uh, it operates between 400 and 800 megahertz. That gives you the redshift range of 0.8 to 2.5 that you're interested in. And we have first light. So uh, we got our first fringes on September 7th, 2017. Uh, Canada found this to be a really big deal. It's a very expensive telescope for them. So uh, the uh, Minister of Science actually came out. This is her in front of one of the chime cylinders and they had a big, big shindig. 
So that means, um, okay, and then uh, just to note, this means that the full chime instrument is um, uh, 80 meters long by 100 meters uh, into the plane of the board. So this is a very large instrument. Um, because it's that large, we don't track it or move it. We just let the sky rotate overhead. Um, so uh, this is uh, a picture or a video of time. The sky is sort of going overhead. Um, we, uh, 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 the design of the cylindrical shape of these dishes gives us access to about 60% uh, of the sky every day. Um, which is why we went with the cylindrical design. Um, and it's located in Penticton, British Columbia at the Dominion Radio Astrophysical Observatory. Okay, so nothing like CHIME has ever been built before. No one's tried to make this measurement. No one's tried to build a big interferometer to do this. So we thought maybe before we built CHIME, we should build something a little smaller first. Uh, so we built the Pathfinder. It's a smaller version of CHIME. We have just two cylinders. They have the same width, so they're 20 meters wide, but they're a little shorter, so they're about 40 meters long. We instrumented them with 128 dual pole feeds, so that's um, about a tenth the number of channels. That makes it a fairly tractable problem to deal with. Um, it's written up in a proceedings from a few years ago if you're interested about the instrument itself. And we've been taking data now for a couple of years with the Pathfinder and using it to prototype um, sort of uh, technology things that we'd like to do. Um, so because I'm an experimentalist, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the instruments. So the, uh, the uh, uh, dish is obviously a cylinder, as I've said. So this is a picture of the Pathfinder cylinder. The light gets focused by the cylinder up onto a focal line. Um, we uh, instrument the focal line with a bunch of feeds. So these are um, uh, dual polarization, basically fancy dipole feeds that have a fairly wide band. Um, one of the grad students spent about six months designing this feed to make sure to ensure that it would have nice properties across our entire band. Um, there are a few interesting things about Chime. One is because we knew that we were going to try to build over 1,000 elements of everything in the future. Uh, we wanted to make sure anything we designed could be sort of mass producible and ideally not had to be hand soldered by a graduate student. Um, so, uh, so one of the main design challenges really was trying to figure out a way that we could get companies to do things like this. So this feed is a very mass producible sort of object that you can get uh, you know, other people to make for you. So the signal gets picked up by the, uh, by the antenna and then uh, sent out of these two ports on the back of the feed. So they're dual polarization ports, so we get two polarizations out of every feed. Um, directly on the back of that feed, so also living on that focal line, are our first stage amplifiers or our low noise amplifiers. Um, these have nice noise properties. This is actually a, a version one, basically, amplifier. I'm going to point out the noise temperature. So um, this is frequency on the x axis. Our noise temperature is in blue, um, and that's here on the uh, right hand side of the plot. So our noise temperature is about 30 Kelvin across our band between 400 and 800 megahertz. For people who don't think about noise and temperature units, which would be entirely normal, um, I uh, will just note that the thesis project I worked on, which was trying to find inflationary gravity waves, had uh, noise temperatures that were about 30 Kelvin. So this is a nice low noise amplifier and we have over 1000 of them on chime. Um, also, we had to make these mass producible and, you know, sort of something that we could get a company to build as well. So, again, another, you know, one of those challenges that sort of comes with the prototype instruments. From there, the signal is sent across a bunch of long coaxial cables and amplified again. Uh, so, our uh, uh, second stage amplifiers live in a shipping container. Um, that is uh, uh, how you know this is a cosmology experiment. The shipping container always gives it away. Um, the signals are then amplified by another bank of amplifiers. So if you wanted to know what a wall of 256 amplifiers looks like, this is about it. Um, they also had to be mass reproducible, mass producible, so they look a lot like the first stage amplifiers, uh, but with an extra little component on it. So this uh, amplifies the signal again and filters it into our band. And from there, those signals are correlated together. So CHIME is an interferometer. It correlates the signals from all of those, uh, all of those inputs um, and channelizes them into a thousand frequencies. So that happens in a set of two different massive electronics components. So one are our digitizers. Uh, this is the crate for the Pathfinder. Normally it's filled with boards. 
Um, that uh, digitizes our signal and then channelizes it, so it turns it into a thousand different frequencies and then sends it along a backplane to a massive set of uh, GPU nodes that do the physical spatial correlation. So this is what's known for the radio, any radio astronomers in the audience as an FX correlator. There is a ton of data flowing across this backplane. So full chime uh, will ha has eight of these crates. It uh, sends about 13 terabits per second across its backplane. Um, you can compare that to the global cell phone traffic of 10 terabits per second in 2014. So this is a lot of data uh, for, uh, for the two processing stages. Um, after the signal is uh, correlated in these GPU nodes, it's averaged in and integrated down so that we can actually transfer it to a place where we can analyze it. Um, and just to give you a sense of scale for what full chime actually is, this is the half of the full chime correlator. So this is one of those filled racks, uh, one of those filled crates, and this is half of the GPU banks. Uh, so our, our second half of the corridor, correlator lives in two 40-foot shipping containers um, next to the chime, uh, chime telescope. This is one of those 40-foot uh, shipping containers. It is filled to the brim with nodes and water cooling and all this different stuff. So it's um, quite an endeavor to get the correlator functional. So as easy as our um, analog and amplifier components are, all of the really heavy lifting comes in in these digital components. Yeah, you had a question. What's being correlated? Yeah, so every feed that live, every signal that, uh, every, uh, every feed that uh, lives on the, on the focal line of these cylinders has two signals coming out of it. So we have 2,000 signals uh, across the entire instrument. Every single one of those signals gets multiplied by every other input signal. So you have a 2048 times 2048 operation. And you have that for 1,000 frequency channels, which is why that number is 13 terabits per second. Yeah, right. Uh, so I, I d didn't at all talk about interferometry because I d don't really have time in most colloquia. Um, so the way that radio astronomers uh, basically build larger dishes is by building dishes further apart from each other and then correlating the signals together. So this is a total, I mean, pe radio astronomers have used interferometers for decades and decades and decades. Um, that's just to say that, not, not that that makes it logical, but just that the uh, this is a totally established technique. Um, so uh, when radio astronomers want to measure uh, tiny little scales on the sky, they throw the two, their two interferometric dishes far apart from each other. That gives you uh, sensitivity to scales that, uh, that are uh, equivalent to having a dish that's as large as the spacing. Um, so the way you do that is to take those two signals and basically multiply them by each other. So we're doing that. We're just doing it in a stupid way that no radio astronomer ever would. So radio astronomy telescopes don't look like this. They would never build a set of a regular grid of cylindrical dishes. This is not what you would do to make a nice map of a galaxy. Uh, it is what you would do if you want to make a nice map of large scale structure and pick out this nice baryon acoustic oscillation feature. Um, so we, uh, to boost our signal to noise on these BAO scales, you can imagine uh, taking two pairs of things that are spaced equally apart, so two of the cylinders, for example, with two feeds on it, and adding, um, co-adding things that are spaced similarly together, and that boosts your signal to noise to that one scale you know, that's equivalent to the spacing of those two dishes. But uh, you know, what you really do is try to multiply all of them together and then add in some much more clever space if we could possibly do that. Okay. Uh, so, um, so as I said, we've been taking data with the Pathfinder now for a couple of years. This was one of the first maps we made from the first few days of data. Um, so again, we have a thousand frequency bins. So this is just one of those 1,000 frequency bins. Um, so the full Pathfinder data set has those thousand frequency bins over three years. So there are a few things I'll point out in this map. One is that it fills about 60% of the sky. So this is a, you know, the equivalent of one day of data. This is what the cylindrical design gets you. So the fact that you uh, have built your dishes to be a cylindrical, uh, in a cylindrical design means that you can map the full sky every day that you can see from wherever you are. So, you, so from Canada, we can map about 60% of the sky. Um, so uh, 
we also have uh, the ability to see the sky, which is great. So the uh, galaxy is this bright swath right here. Um, you can also see the North Polar Spur going off uh, on the right-hand side, and you can pick out some point sources. So this, for the radio astronomers in the audience, is Tau A, Cas A, Sig A, and Virgo A. Um, we can also compare that to uh, simulated data. So if you uh, make a simulated map of the sky and run it through the same map maker, you find a lot of the same features. So obviously the galaxy is a nice uh, broad band. You can see the, the North Polar Spur and then a lot of the point sources um, come, uh, uh, come out of this as well. Um, so that was at least nice to see that we measure the sky and that it looks fairly reasonable from the Pathfinder. Uh, we also have our first result from CHIME. So this was a paper that came out earlier this year. Um, this is not, sadly, a cosmology result. We don't have those yet. Um, but we can constrain uh, the number of bright, fast radio bursts that, uh, that uh, we can see from CHIME. So because CHIME makes pictures of the sky every day, over 60% of the sky, we can uh, figure out if we have any bright transients and then constrain the number of bright transients if we if we see any of them. Turns out we didn't see any over the course of the uh, sort of couple of month data run that we had. So we could constrain the total number of bright radio bursts. So for, for people who like transients, um, I can talk to you more about this paper. That's our first science results, although not cosmology results. So um, I started this whole talk off um, uh, noting that it would be great to have measurements in this redshift range and to have small error bars with them. So let's see how CHIME does relative to our current measurements. So um, full CHIME is shown in red. You can see, first of all, we uh, fill in this redshift range from 0.8 to 2.5, which was what we had designed the instrument to do. And the measurements um, have, you know, uh, project, are projected to have nice small error bars, um, a little bit smaller than that nice seven sigma result, even at very high redshift. The expected errors from the Pathfinder are also shown in blue. So you can see, even though the Pathfinder as an engineering array, um, uh, you know, sort of a technology demonstrator, um, you could have just thrown the data away. We could instead actually use it to try to do cosmology. It also measures um, structure in this interesting redshift range, although of course with slightly larger error bars or larger error bars. Um, so that's all well and good, uh, but uh, we have problems too. Uh, so you may have noticed that in that preliminary map, uh, you didn't see any rings or galaxies or uh, you know, uh, statistical measurements of galaxies. We saw really only one galaxy, which was our own galaxy. Uh, so this is our Milky Way galaxy. It's very bright in our, uh, in our band, everywhere in 400 to 800 megahertz. And this is our biggest problem in 21 centimeter cosmology. So the um, galaxy itself is very, very bright relative to our cosmological signal. How bright? Uh, so um, this is, these are simulations uh, made by Richard Shaw. So our um, uh, estimates of the unpolarized foreground can go up to as high as 750 Kelvin in the map. You can compare that to simulations of the 21 centimeter signal, so this is our interesting signal, which are 140 microkelvin. Uh, so this is a uh, sort of six or so order of magnitude difference between the signal of interest that we care about and, uh, and, our, and you know, the, the galaxy that's much brighter. Uh, there is hope, though. So um, the, uh, if you take, for example, a little slice of the galaxy and ask what is its frequency dependence, um, the frequency uh, axis is blown up a little bit on the, on the y-axis, and you can see it's very smooth in frequency. And you can compare that to the signal itself, which is very ripply in frequency. So this tells you that you could distinguish between the foregrounds, which are smooth, and the signal of interest, which is ripply, by sort of decomposing it into smooth stuff and ripply stuff, um, and then removing your foregrounds that way. Doing so uh, is possible, so that's what these simulations showed, but uh, you do have to understand your instrument very, very well. So we have to know our instrument gain to about 1%, and we have to know our instrument beams to about 0.1%. Um, so I'm going to focus on the second one because it's the one I spend all of my time thinking about. Um, so first of all, why, why do we have to care about our beams, and what is a beam anyway? So. Uh, uh, the 
point spread function or beam from our telescope, we can draw in a cartoonish way a sort of an airy function. So as the telescope points up, you have a lot of uh, response to the location where your telescope is pointed and then not much response off of wherever you're pointed. So it's just telling you when you point a telescope somewhere, um, you know most of the power is coming from the place where you're pointing it. The width of this beam and the size of this point spread function are dependent on frequency. So at 400 megahertz, you have a fairly wide beam. At 800 megahertz, you have a beam that's about half the size. So um, uh, a point source that lives right, uh, right where you're pointed, right where your telescope is pointed, you'll measure it with an amplitude that's just related to how, what your gain is uh, at, a, at a given frequency. So if you know something about your instrument, you can uh, back out how bright the source is. If the source, however, is off of the beam, main beam, uh, you may measure it at half of the amplitude at 400 megahertz. Maybe you measure it in a null at 600 megahertz. And maybe you measure it at a little side lobe location at 800 megahertz. So what you've done is take um, just a simple point source, and as you move it, as, you know, as the sky rotates overhead and it moves through your beam, you can actually inject a frequency dependence into this measurement just because of where uh, the source lives in the beam. That's bad because most of the sky is made up of bright point sources. So that means we inject purely by uh, you know, foregrounds a frequency, you know, by the galactic foregrounds, we inject a frequency dependence into the measurement that's not actually there in the sky. That's okay as long as we understand our beam. So if we know what all these shapes are, we can uh, reconstruct what the sky looks like and remove it, but we do have to understand our beam very well. So that's what I spend all of my time doing. This is complicated by yet another thing, which is that the chime beam is uh, uh, ugly, so to, bald, to put it baldly. <laughs> so the cylindrical design means that we can measure 60% of the sky every day, but the beam itself is really gross. It's not very like uh, symmetric. Uh, it looks kind of like a hot dog. It's large, so we don't measure any given point source with high signal to noise, so we can't just take a point source and and, uh, and use that to measure our beam. We need a different way to do it. So there are a few things we could do. Uh, the first thing that we've done is to use something called a holographic technique. So we have a steerable dish that lives right near the pathfinder. We put a 400 to 800 megahertz instrument at the focus of that dish. The signal is uh, sent down a set of coaxial cables and over to the pathfinder where we correlate the signal directly in the chime correlator. Why would you bother to do that? Um, you can uh, use the steerable dish to track sources as it transits through the chime beam. That boosts your signal to noise to a given source and allows you to measure uh, with exquisite accuracy the, uh, the chime beam shape for each of the locations of the sources that you're tracking with this 26 meter dish. So again, you don't have to believe me, we've made these measurements. So um, this is uh, one holographic transit uh, showing the chime beam shape. Uh, this is using the brightest radio source in the sky, Cygnus A. Um, so this is uh, our equivalent of that airy pattern on the sky. So you can see this is our main beam shape. And we have uh, side lobes off to the side that are certainly not very symmetric. Um, and these measurements were made over the course of about three months. Um, which is showing uh, one nice thing, which is they're very repeatable. So our beams are not changing dramatically over time. Uh, this stuff is the sun making it into the measurement. Um, so this analysis was done by a graduate student who is uh, at Toronto. Um, and so we can make these measurements for all of the, all of the, uh, all of the uh, feeds uh, across the whole pathfinder and then use that to try to figure out our, our uh, Feed and frequency dependent beam shape. The, the, the beam is 2D though, right? It is 2D, exactly. Yeah, yeah. 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 Kind of yeah. So for, uh, it looks like I deleted the slide somehow, but um, uh, that's bad. Yeah, so our beam is two dimensional. Um, it looks like a hot dog in the sky. So uh, it basically just looks like the projection of a cylinder on the sky. Every source that transits, you get one little slice through the, through the short part of the beam. So you get, it's really a shame, uh, you, get just a, yeah, you get just a slice through the oblong part of the beam. So that this thing behind the picture of the drone is like a hot dog shaped thing. Every uh, source makes a little slice through the, through the beam. So, on the previous slide, where you have the same source, but it's different dates, so 
right? Yeah. So is that, is it changing? No, so suddenly the RA index, so the source location relative to chime is fixed. The only source that moves is the sun. Well, and the moon, but the moon is less useful. So you can use the sun to try to trace out that north-south beam because it does move. It does actually move in declination, unlike these sources. Um, yeah, so one option is you measure, you know, however many slices you can through this technique, which gives you really nice resolution in the side lobe direction, and then believe your beam is smooth in the hot, lo hot dog long uh, direction and then smooth between it. That probably won't work very well. It's unlikely that your beam is very smooth in any direction. So the other option uh, or the, uh, another thing you can try to do is fly a source on a drone and sort of fly that over the, over the chime cylinder and use that to pull out the north-south side. Um, OK. Do you have a problem with the array changing size of the season? No, so the... Um, uh, the metal does contract and expand a little bit, but it does it more along the length direction than sort of this way. Um, that was taken into account a little bit in the design of the of the uh, uh, the design of the dishes, but for the most part, it's kind of small relative to a wavelength. Shockingly, so our wavelengths are 37 to 75 centimeters. So you have to make a pretty big change before you really see it relative to our wavelengths. Um, uh, okay, so, so Chime uh, lives in Canada. It measures 60% uh, of the sky from the northern hemisphere, so we should make nice maps in the northern hemisphere. But there is this whole other half of the sky that we don't measure. Um, that's, a, that's a nice hemisphere to make measurements in because there are a lot of other surveys that are happening in the southern hemisphere. Um, so it would be nice to be able to overlap 21 centimeter surveys with other things that are happening in the southern hemisphere. So um, we are also planning to build HIRAX, the Hydrogen Intensity and Real-Time Analysis Experiment. Um, this will go in uh, the Karoo Desert in South Africa, uh, near the SKA site, so the nice radio quiet site, um, and uh, should ha will have access to the southern sky. So the plan is to uh, instrument uh, over 1,000 six-meter dishes and also operate in the same chime band, so we get to leverage some, some of the development that happened across chime. Um, right now, we are funded for about 128 dishes, so we will have a Pathfinder array that's equivalent uh, in number of dishes to the uh, Pathfinder, Chime Pathfinder. Um, so this is uh, a prototype six-meter dish that we have at a radio site, uh, radio uh, site in South Africa, and these are some of our first fringes between a couple of dishes that we instrumented. So we, uh, I, I hesitate to call that first light because it doesn't really count, but it shows that we uh, have dishes that work, measure the sky, and have uh, put a correlator board in the field that's not broken. So all those things are good, uh, very, very initial measurements for Hyrax. Okay, so I've been talking a lot about baryon acoustic oscillations and how we can make measurements of structure through 21 centimeter surveys of galaxies um, and galaxy surveys themselves. There are other measurements we can make of large scale structure and the structure, um, particularly from the CMB. So the cosmic microwave background, again, is a mission from uh, the universe when it was about 400,000 years old. Those photons have traveled to us over the intervening 13 billion years. And uh, as they traveled through the universe, they got lensed by a lot of the intervening large scale structure, galaxies and clusters, et cetera, the same sorts of things that we're trying to measure with galaxy surveys and 21 centimeter surveys of structure. So we can use this to infer something about the distribution of large scale structure as well in the universe. Um, so again, this is not, a, well, this isn't a measurement, but this, this isn't just a theory. We've used this now to make uh, measurements of the lensed cosmic microwave background. Um, so this is a cartoon of that. So if you have the average integrated uh, structure along the line of sight between us and the cosmic microwave background, um, and this is a measurement of that unlensed CMB, if we add in the lensing potential, I can just flip back and forth, and you can see um, that the CMB moves around a little bit uh, as it sort of went through all of this structure. Um, so doing those measurements requires measurements uh, of the cosmic microwave background at small angular scale, so you can pick out these small features that come from this lensing signal. Um, so you need larger dishes on the order of six meters. So uh, this is one of the things I spent my first postdoc doing. 
So um, AXPOL is a six meter dish that's in Chile. It makes measurements of the cosmic microwave background. And one of the signals you can pull out is this lensing signal. So this is one of the first AXPOL focal planes. It has a thousand detectors that operate at 150 gigahertz at a tiny, tiny little temperature of 100 millikelvin. So this was deployed in 2012 uh, and uh, started taking data in, in 2012. Uh, we ended up having three different receivers at a few different frequencies um, and then uh, expanding that over the past five years or so. So uh, that one single focal plane that I was holding in my hands in this picture um, resulted in five different papers. Um, so two of them are sort of flagship papers of the usual cosmic microwave background measurements. The other three are kind of interesting, so I'm going to point them out. One was a measurement of halo lensing from dark matter. Um, one was a measurement of sort of large-scale structure, uh, 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 correlating it with radio galaxies, and then a sort of probe of the growth rate of structure or an initial measurement of that through the cosmic microwave background. So um, uh, the main reason I'm pointing this out is not because uh, I like jargon, but just to note that three of these measurements were only possible because we happened to overlap our survey with other surveys of uh, other cosmological surveys. So this first one, the dark matter halo lensing, came because we overlapped with the galaxy survey. The second one happened because we overlapped with a radio survey. And this third one also came from an overlapping galaxy survey. So a lot of really interesting measurements come out of um, sort of overlapping surveys and doing cross correlations or stacking of measurements with each other. Um, so that's, I think, one of the interesting sort of areas where we can go with cosmology of having sort of overlapping survey regions to um, sort of tease out some of these um, interesting things that you wouldn't necessarily have just written a paper about if you were all on your own, uh, where you'd only have come out with these two papers. Okay, um, so uh, sort of continuing along that trajectory, um, it's uh, while we're thinking in the era of large surveys and what can we overlap with, the southern sky, as I noted, has a ton of different surveys that, uh, that are making measurements in the, in the next sort of 10 years. One is a very large optical survey called LSST. Um, Advanced ACT and the Simons Observatory, uh, both CMB telescopes will overlap with that region. There are also a lot of interesting galaxy surveys that are coming online or are online already um, uh, in the southern hemisphere. Um, so yeah, if I just sort of overplot the 21 centimeter versions of those surveys, CHIME covers the northern hemisphere, Hyrax will cover the southern hemisphere, and there's a lot of survey overlap between 21 centimeter surveys and uh, and these other large scale structure and CMB surveys. Uh, and then finally, coming soon, you can ask me tons of questions about this. I won't spend any time on it. Um, we are combining two collaborations, uh, the one I worked on, ACT, and then also the Simons Observatory, which are these three dishes, um, to form the Simons Observatory and build two new telescopes in Chile to further enable all of this great uh, cosmic microwave background science. OK, so I started my talk. Um, by noting that we're really interested in this question of accelerated expansion and measurements of large scale structure and the cosmic microwave background can help inform uh, dark energy uh, models. But I also said there's a lot of other stuff that we don't understand and measurements of uh, using intensity mapping surveys like CHIME and also maybe other ones at higher redshift have a lot of other things that you might be able to say about large scale structure and really getting at these questions of things like isotropy um, non-Gaussianity, the sum of the neutrino masses, and, and trying to start answering these questions like, you know, what really is uh, the nature of dark energy? Do we need to think about modifying gravity and things like that? Um, uh, so measurements with intensity mapping surveys, uh, 21 centimeter in particular, but also from other lines, can really start measuring back all the way uh, through the history of the universe and start informing some of these questions. Um, so I think, you know, we've made measurements right now of the cosmic microwave background and of galaxy surveys in the sort of nearby universe. There's a whole lot of the rest of the universe that we can still measure, and these 21 centimeter surveys and surveys like them are really going to start to get at these, uh, these sort of intermediate redshift ranges to try to answer some of these questions. Thank you. Yeah. So the, the, the barometer in South Africa. Yeah. 
why the design is, it looks like sterile dishes. They're going, yeah, so the, the Hyrax dishes um, are steerable in one direction. So, uh, and not steerable per se, but like adjustable is the right word. So um, with a single Hyrax dish, the beam size is like eight degrees or so. So you could only make, if you only had those dishes, you'd made it make about an eight degree wide swath. That's obviously not really that great. Like you'd like to measure more of the sky than that. So the idea is you'd make a measurement for a few months and then shift the dish to, dishes to another location and then shift it again. So you have to do sort of a stepped survey. Why not the, why not the cylinder? Um, uh, a few reasons. So one of them is that simply building something that looks identical to Chime is like probably a bad funding case for South Africa, which is not a good reason. But just that's one that it, just to say, like you know, building an identical thing is not doesn't usually fly very well. Um, the second reason is, uh, as someone who measures the beams for Chime, I would look forward to having a round dish. Um, we. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, the beams are complicated, and um, we don't necessarily understand a lot about them from first principles. So you can, you know, simulate it with an E and M package and pull out some of the features, but not a lot of the features of the wonderful uh, uh, and complicated chime cylindrical beam shape. So um, <coughs> I think, from the sort of perspective of like this is a hard measurement to make already, maybe. Uh, we shouldn't try to do everything at once, and maybe having you know dishes uh, that you might find more easily calibratable could be a, could be a benefit. That's not to say that I don't think we can make a measurement from Chime. It's just um, you know if you're looking at building a new experiment and your question is, do I build a cylinder or do I try dishes? Um, it's not crazy to do dishes maybe instead of cylinders and just try something different. Yeah. What does Chime cost, and how does that break into? Oh, yeah, okay, so the, the official cost is about $10 million, but Canada has this weird thing where you um, double, you sort of double the money uh, from getting things from industry, so it's actually complicated for me to try to figure out how much exactly it is because there's a bunch of double counting that happens, but it's an order of $10 million experiment. Um, uh, I think about half of the money ended up going into the dishes and the other half ended up going into the um, correlator. I think that wasn't how the division was envisioned when they first put the proposal together. So one of the reasons people went with cylinders was it was supposed to be cheaper um, than building a dish array. Uh, but uh, it turns out that when you build something in Canada and you have to make sure that it um, follows all of the regulations for humans to walk on things, uh, you start building a beefier uh, set of dishes than you expected in the beginning. So it, I, think, I think the dishes turned out to be a little more expensive than they thought, but it, I think it ended up about sort of order of half and half. Yeah. Uh, I remember a couple of years ago, people were objecting to China when they detect negative aspects of universe. Yeah. But if I understood you correctly, they zero? We've detected zero with the Pathfinder. Um, we are not in an optimal um, uh, data taking mode to be able to find fast radio bursts. So uh, the history of this is that there is a whole second set of GPUs living in their own enormous shipping container um, for full chime that's just dedicated to measuring fast radio bursts. The Pathfinder ended up not having a very fast mode on it. And so there's like, we could feed a little bit of the signal off, but it, it was a very suboptimal way of making the measurement. But, uh, you know, we could place a constraint on the bright, you know, how many bright ones, which were zero or something. So due to various models, that turned out to be a maybe interesting constraint, um, but isn't a, a harbinger for what we think we're going to be able to do from, from an experiment like full time, where you actually have a dedicated set of things trying to measure it and people like Kendrick Smith who can just revolutionize how you're going to detect them anyway. So, yeah. yeah. The data that you showed us from Chuck, how long would it take to make a plan to obtain this error Oh, yeah, good. I didn't say that. Um, so for Pathfinder, that was a two-year survey. For Full Chime, it was a five-year survey. What were the error bars? Those error bars included zero systematics and no foreground removal at all. I mean, um, uh, assuming we completely removed foregrounds, I guess is the way I should put that. So they are, you know, 
uh, probably far too optimistic, um, uh, but didn't. In, but it were purely noise. Uh, noise. Uh, so chime would be basically a cosmic variance limited or a sample variance limited measurement. Um, the pathfinder uh, is in, in a certain part of its of that um, of the redshift space, but not all of them.